<clears throat> so as I cough, welcome back to everybody. Uh, Ponch is in and out. He's got some uh, yo-yo in camera, but I'm sure it'll stabilize in good time once he gets his OODA loop under control. See what I did there, folks. So uh, this, I believe, is, is session four. And there was some good conversation going off just before I started the recording. Uh, but I'm going to remind everybody of the real reason we decided to have this conversation. So is we, uh, Lou had said, I said in the last uh, chat, how can Kenevin be used, and I'm reading from my screen, how can Kenevin be used to exploit what we know about how OODA works to get faster OODA loops? which is in or faster ooders, which is interesting because we had that whole thing about the timey wimey sort of slinky kinky slinky description about whether time could be elongated and whether the OODA loop has to be rapid or it can it, whether it is time bound or not or it's sort of free in time and then there's some extra notes that Lou wrote which if we could be efficient as if we could be as efficient as possible in learning and getting good at doing things across different domains of Kenevin by acknowledging the domain that things sit in, then we can take, then we can improve your capacity to operate in that domain effectively. I'm just paraphrasing my bad grammar. Um, and the question, the thing we were talking about, which I'll fire out and everybody's here, is we're talking about decision making while everybody was joining. And Lou raised the point about naturalized decision making. And some people sort of think that if a decision's instinctive, it's not actually a decision. Um, which is interesting given that a lot of what we see in very rapid OODA loops, if we look at the sort of flying military aircraft sort of concept or in the police work, um, then a lot of that is instinctive. It's that implicit guidance and control by definition, I'm guessing. I'm looking at the military folks on the camera, which is everybody, but probably me, Blaney and, and Kim. So, but basically, um, uh, that's isn't that by definition instinctive so then are we saying that nothing in the OODA loop that's implicit guidance and control is really decisions so i don't know i'm going to throw that open to the floor and then we can move into Kenevin when everybody's ready and lou you asked to share the screen so feel free at any time if you want to i was just going to mention that that's something sparked there it's really interestingly like as soon as you said that i kind of felt like there might be three levels there instead of just the the two of the, the binary on or off because I, I see a difference between instinct subconscious and conscious so you've kind of got the programmed the drilled and the considered if that kind of makes sense so instinctive things are something that you are pre-programmed really to do and th there's no decision at all I guess in those because you know it, it's just built into you but you can drill something, but you can re-drill to change that drill. So although you might not be thinking about it necessarily, it's something you have a modicum of control over, or you can craft over time. Um, and then of course, there's the considered aspects. Uh, it was just, that just came to mind while you were saying that. So I thought I'd add that into the mix. I think that those, all those things were good, Lou. All right, I'm gonna share my screen here since we got to stick on the... Uh on the OODA premise. So if you look at, if you look at the model here from just a, 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 a letter of the law, right? The decision feeds forward and you get to pick the decision route or the implicit guidance and control route. And much like uh, Chris, I do not necessarily agree that we're just down one or the other, right? It's like there's varying shades of, of, of consciousness on this, right? So you've got some things that are extremely, extremely analytical and rational in thought, right? Where you're completely focused on it, eating up all your bandwidth on a hard, a hard math problem, let's say. But then at the other uh, side, it's you're completely like blacked out, right? You're, uh, and this could be because you're scared, you're drunk, or you're tired. Right. And when you're scared, drunk and tired, uh, you start losing that rational brain capacity and you start reverting back to things that are conditioned and automatic. And that would be about as like pure of implicit guidance and control as you could possibly be. Now, this implicit guidance and control is always operating. Right. Like, you know, I'm I could drink coffee and talk at the same time. Right. I'm not thinking about drinking the coffee, though. So what uh, what I what I would say is that. 
there's like high consciousness, right? And low implicit guidance and control. And other times when it's high implicit guidance and control and low consciousness. And I think what we wanna do is be able to do all the best, the right, the most appropriate things automatically as possible to keep as much brain power open for rational decision-making. And, and that's my whole thought behind this question of today as to what is it that we do with all of the, all the things we're responsible for making decisions or responses of is how do we, how do we train it up and develop it so we do just that. We open up as much decision-making capacity as possible and relegate also as much into the implicit guidance and control while maintaining it being appropriate and right. Hey, Lou, it's Punch. I, I agree with you. The uh, the idea of like system two to system one thinking, which we went over a few weeks ago, is critical. And uh, one of the things I'm going through right now is my, my scapula is all jacked up because whatever reason, and it's hurting my shoulder. So I have to consciously learn how to reprogram it to work in a way that I don't have to think about it anymore, right? Because it's injuring my shoulder. And uh, this is this, this is that, uh, you know, I, I'm consciously trying to work it, going through the decision um, feed, feed, uh, feed forward loop rather than through implicit guidance and control. Eventually, uh, that's gonna become easier, it's gonna become more natural, right? And that's, I think that's the same thing we do with any type of process we learned. Uh, and a process could be something as, you know, in aviation, how we learned how to plan, brief, execute, debrief, how, how we actually learn how to plan and leverage multiple perspectives. It doesn't come natural. So you have to work at it, and that is a high energy approach, right? You spend a lot of energy trying to do this. Over time, it becomes easier, it becomes natural. And in fact, one of the challenges most aviator, aviators have in coaching organizations is they go, well, what do you mean you don't know how to do this? This is what we've done for many, many years. And we have to go through that cognitive task analysis to figure out what it is that makes it special for uh, effective planning, hedging, uh, looking at contingencies and doing that uh, pretty much all the time. So uh, I agree with you, Lou. It's, um, yeah, I think the, the, the underlying science suggests that uh, the brain is, um, you know, we're lazy. You know, it, it's looking for efficient ways to do things and it'll take shortcuts all the time. So if those shortcuts are uh, uh, taking you through bad neighborhoods and, and you know, slowing down your, your OODA loop or having a, a low quality OODA loop, then that's not a good thing to have, right? And that's really what we're trying to do with organizations is improve that OODA loop, improve that team OODA loop, improve the individual OODA loop uh, so, they can, so they can see things that they didn't see before. So go yeah go ahead Ben because I'm I'm still I'm still of the 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 opinion that your brain what do you want to call it a biological computer or just some sort of decision making center it's it's something that's telling our bodies to do certain things without us having to think about it like blinking breathing you know or in in when we're in flight or fight fight or flight mode it takes over and stuff just happens. Or if you if something slips out of your hand, you go to grab it. You don't you don't make a conscious decision. It's it's muscle memory, but that muscle memory to me is still your brain making decisions. You've just it's just becoming well. That's that's the thing. So Ben, I'm going to bring you in on that point. And anything else you want to say? Um. So what I wanted to throw out there was the possibility that actually we're doing both pathways at the same time, rather than switching between them. That we we are spreading our energy it's like a, you know the, the brain is a I, I, I may have mentioned this on the last call but one of the books i've read recently is a, the thousand brain theory or, or a thousand brains by um, jeff hawkins which is about the kind of the computational mechanisms of the brain and, and what he's saying which was really quite different to how many other people think about it is that instead of instead of this kind of multi-layer um kind of perception machine where you know you you build simple things in one layer and then that gets passed into more complex things in the next layer and, and the next layer and that builds the model up what he's saying actually is that each layer is doing everything in parallel so rather than um rather than you know you know something and you're operating solely in the implicit guidance and control pathway what i would suggest is that we've actually got multiple different spectrums of implicit guidance and control up to decisions and they're all operating in parallel 
but you know much like i don't know if you've ever seen the videos of um slow slow motion videos of lightning right all we see is one big stripe coming down but actually what's happening is that there are multiple tiny ones reaching up at the same time and then those those meet so i would i would suggest that a useful analogy for what we're thinking about here is that all of these things are all happening in parallel but there's only one that's kind of consciously available to us at the time. And we, and we switch, we switch up and down them as appropriate or sometimes inappropriate, right? Sometimes we, we take the implicit uh, to, to lose point when, when you're drunk or, or tired or scared, you take the low energy pathway, even though the other one is probably available to you, but you just, you're just not aware of it. So that's what, what came up when, uh, when you guys were talking just then. Okay. So um, because we're going to talk about the different domains of Kinevin and how our OODA loops change or potentially change, because this was the original work done at Quantico when Ponch and Lou and others got around, I guess, a series of whiteboards and, and ranted and argued and, and debated and discussed and drew pictures and then somehow it ended up in the book, uh, which caused Andrew to say, let's have these conversations. So let's come back to that. Lou's going to share his screen. Uh, I did see Kim making a note as well that she wants to talk about the default mate, def default modes in the domains. Um, so it's a good time for you to share that slide, Lou, if you want. And then um, I'll try and position my uh, screen view so um, people will be able to see everybody on the screen as well as the slide. Hopefully uh, Zoom will record that right. So, um, hey, Lou, why don't you kick it off since you're controlling the slide? So I black and whiteed out the Kinevin framework and I've added in these red words and everything that we do in, in, in my world, policing, right, is referred to as training, right? We don't talk about uh, going to a workshop. We don't talk about going to a, maybe a course, but it, it's all like called training. And it irks me because training is just like one part of like what we do as humans to develop ourselves. And I want to be a little bit more purposeful and accurate with the words. So I like to drop in practice down here because it's kind of like swinging a golf club or playing a piano. You got to practice, right? It's, it's about repeating it and conditioning yourself. Whereas training is more like learning a new skill and adding something to your repertoire that you will eventually be practicing. Um, I put simulation up here. I don't know where it belongs, right? But like simulation is maybe something that, uh, requires some decision-making now, right? Because if you're really talking about practice, we're really not talking about decisions. We're talking about just uh, like rehearsal, choreography and, and, and copying really. And then you've, we've got the experimenting and we've got scenarios where we're able to engage with the environment. And this is how I see the different learning or, or, or coaching educational development methods and how they overlay with Kinevin. And these are the things that I think will allow us to start to relegate some of the skills and responses into the subconscious. And that's all in with the strategy to speed up our loop, open up brain power for the stuff on the left side of this. So I'd like to drop it there and let you guys tear that apart. Just to just why you're doing that because the decision making thing then becomes important because you've got that that <laughs> implicit guidance and control where some of that stuff just happens um and you've got that deep thinking process where you have to actually take all those inputs and make a decision and execute so this actually the, the two actually segue nicely together um whoever wants to pick this up um feel free to do so kim hey good morning Hi. Good morning. Uh, so I like the simulation. What you got me thinking about, Lou, with the simulation is it depends on whether it's a subjective thing or an objective thing. So what I mean is your interpretation of a complex thing, if it is a subjective reason that it's complex, so you don't know what the expected impact is because you've never experienced it, you've never understood it, you've never learned it, but it is possible to learn then a simulation is an, a safe environment to experiment in so that you can turn it from being a subjective understanding of this thing being complex to actually being 
now a subjective understanding of that thing is now complicated or clear. So um, that's why I think simulation floats between the two because it could be sitting in the domain of expertise um, or it could be a safe place to do experimentation um, in a mock complex environment. Uh, the other point I was, I was also wanting to make was about um, the default modes. So if you think about our instinctive reactions or the learnt drilled behaviours, and when we you know, have a lot of other pressures on us, that's what tends to surface. I think we have to be very careful what our default modes are depending on what type of domain we're in. So if we're in, um, if our natural default mode is to do a lot of experimentation, well, we're gonna waste a lot of time in the clear domain. We could have just looked it up on Google. Uh, and, vice, and vice versa, if our default mode is to, I mean, that's why when you're under this pressure and you're in a complex domain and you then go into a default mode, because the outcome isn't predictable, sometimes it's fine and other times it's not. So that's what I mean. I think that uh, the instinctive decision-making or default mode, <coughs> if we can get better at understanding what our default modes are and therefore what domain we're in, we're going to get better at understanding whether we're going to end up with a good outcome or potentially uh, not very good outcome. You know, it seems hey. what... Oh, sorry, Ron. Hey, Ron, how are you doing? Welcome. Good, good. It, it seems like we're saying that if you can do things in, the, in that default mode that you're in the clear domain, and I, I think they're domain independent. I mean, you can operate in a default, in, in that uh, uh, implicit guidance mode uh, in any of the domains. Well, uh, you know, not maybe not the, uh, uh, the what, what's the AC one now uh, disorder, but it, it, you know I spend we spend most of our time in policing and complex and chaotic, and but we do an awful lot of things uh, with implicit guidance and offload an awful lot to implicit guidance and in our simulations and our scenarios we're trying to integrate those skills and integrate the the things we're learning and the things we're doing to the place where we can get to. Uh, a, a lot of implicit guidance being loaded on that side so that we're more able to think clearly about the actual decisions that we have to make. Does that make sense? I mean, we're running simultaneously in that decision piece and the, and the implicit guidance piece. But I think the more you learn and the more you learn to integrate those skills um, in a stressful situation, which you can do with simulation and scenarios, the better you are at uh, just letting that run and then using your decision-making uh, power to, to you know, really focus on, on what's needed in this situation and the other stuff kind of follows. Ben. Yeah, this is, this is interesting. I've, this is something that I've been mulling over a lot. Can I, can I suggest uh, maybe a slightly different frame on this? Can I suggest that these are all examples of simulation and that they range in the level of surprise that you expect when you go through the simulation from memorization and practice on the one hand, which is low in the clear domain, through to scenarios and wargaming and experimentation on the other hand, which is where you're in complex or chaotic, where you are going to be surprised much more. Because like the, the, the reason I say that is that we're always simulating, right? Our, our observations are not what we see. They are what we that they're what they're, they are what we construct from our um, sensory apparatus. They're not they're not actually actually the real world. So everything, everything in this is a, is a simulation. Um, and it's a question of like, you know, if you do something in the complex domain and you, you start off with experimenting and, and scenarios and, and, and things like that, eventually you'll be in a position as an expert where somebody comes into that situation and you're watching them do that thing, but you're in the, now in the domain of practice and choreography and memorization because you know it cold, but you're still simulating, you're just surprised less. 
I actually, I, I'm going to put my hand up. I actually think that's a really good way to describe it because as I was, I was, I was <clears> looking at all of this, these are all the things you do to better prepare yourself for when the surprises come and the more capable you are responding to lots of different, I'll just use the general word scenarios and, and lots of different things that happen. And I guess you could, because Chris is, of course, our martial arts guru. I could sort of look at the sort of Bruce Lee example. Bruce Lee studied, you know, ex well, as far as I was concerned, when I was a kid idolizing him, he studied all these amazing martial arts and was, innate, was able most of the time to always come out on top in, uh, in competition because he was so good at many of the things that you, you were looking at on the screen there. Um, because it's all just become implicit. The more you train, the more you practice, the more different words that we had on the screen a minute ago that you actually do experimenting, choreography and, and experiment, you know, scenario planning and all these different things. Eventually, you've got such a repertoire of built-in knowledge that you've finely tuned and finely honed that a lot of that becomes implicit. And, and in the police officers and the military world, it damn well needs to be because you ain't got time to sit there planning. Yes, Chris, go for it. I was just going to say, it, but that has to be um, apposite, right? Because if you drill the wrong things, you're being very inhibitive. So it, it, when we were talking about like, um, you know, Ron was saying you can, you can have all of these in kind of any other domains, you can, but that isn't necessarily telling you which domain you are in. It might be the domain you think you're in, which isn't necessarily a good um, um, place to be and so I, I think it's interesting because I was going to ask Ben what at what point does simulation become prediction or, or what what delineation do we have and of course we don't live in a polar universe but prediction is where you know what the next thing will be so I think that yes they, they can all be a simulation but I don't think that's true a hundred percent of the time sometimes there are things you can predict through repetition um, which is, of course, how we, you know, put things into it, like automation and whatever, taking all the little irregularities out that drop you off the cliff into chaos and various other things. So there is a, a difference between the simulation side and the um, and the prediction side and the simulation side. To be successful, a simulation doesn't have to it doesn't have a goal. A simulation can just give you scenarios so that you can prepare yourself. And that may or may not be correct. But a prediction has to be correct because you have to be able to predict what's going to happen consistently. Does, does that kind of make sense? Slightly does, different. Does pre, I'm going to go to Ben in a second but, or anybody else, but does prediction start to come as a result of simulation? You've done, you've done so much simulation and training and practice that you can now predict. And your predictions are pretty accurate most of the time, hopefully. Otherwise, you, you need to do more of the other thing. Mm. I don't know, Ben, what do you think? Yeah, so I, I think this this goes back to that example, the the redrawn um, OODA loop starting from action, right? When you, when you take an action, you have a prediction, right? You have a prediction of how, how it's going to turn out. You might, be, you might be surprised and it might be wrong, or you might be an expert and you might be almost always right. But I think uh, certainly from what I think i understand of cognition simulation and prediction are exactly the same thing they're, they're intertwined they're impossible to um they're impossible to separate and and what we're talking about really is the spectrum of how surprised you are um, um yeah hey thanks Nigel. so uh coming from a, uh, a culture where you're in simulation 99 percent of the time um that simulation we're actually going through all the domains right it's 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 we're practicing I'll give you a quick scenario. We throw a new crew in, uh, give them a complicated problem, uh, oil pressure problem on one engine, a hydraulic problem on the other engine, change the weather on them, give them a change in conditions as they take off. We let them get airborne. And what they end up doing is they make bad decisions as a crew. Um, they, they put themselves in a horrible situation. They end up in chaos because they, they, they didn't think through their bigger picture. And that what that does is it actually tells us how they're going to do under stress, right? So it is predictive. We can, we can see that when you're when things start getting piled on you, you get more stress how do you make decisions in that so uh like i said 99 percent of our time in aviation was spent in simulators simulation training that one percent time is when we're actually uh, executing now contrast this with what's happening in, in organizations they get one percent of their time to do simulation and they don't they don't know how to do it right and they get 99 percent of their time to execute 
So um, just when you start talking about this whole simulation thing, that's what triggered me is if we're going to do some type of anthro simulation, uh, human and machine manipulation of the environment, why are we doing that? We want to see how people act and then let them learn going back to a, a couple uh, calls ago implicitly, right? How are you learning from this? What are you learning from that and that? So I don't look at the simulation as, you know, a hypothetical, oh, it may be this, maybe that. I look at it as like, this is how a knuckle dragger did it in the past and it works very, very well to create um, some type of capability for a team or individual. Whoa, who wants to add to that? I'm waiting for Lou to come back because at the end of the day, I want to see how this maps to the way we execute the OODA loop in each of these different domains. Uh, Andrew, please go for it. Yeah, I'm just picking up on, on, on what Brian said there. And I think one of the things that I think cripples most organizations is that when you go and speak to exec teams or, or watch exec teams in action, the the decision-making capability of those teams is highly compromised by the politics in the room and by the relationships between individuals. And I think one of the things that, uh, well, from, from what Ponch has been saying, that the military gets really right is uh, basically finding ways for teams to get together um, and, and know exactly what their role is in the decision-making context so you don't have a lot of that stuff. And so, and then actually, I suppose those, um, si those simulations help to uh, smooth the process of decision-making for a high-performance team in the military, which we don't necessarily see. Like when I'm sitting with exec teams, you can often see the politics at play. You can see the individual reward mechanisms at play when decisions are being um are being made and then you also see the white handing afterwards and the um and, and the kind of people will come together in a room and say yes we're all on board but then as soon as you leave the room then um th that all that all disappears and it goes back to infighting and, and and games um so i think there's a lot that organizations can learn from that i think we lost ponch he'll come back he was getting his ipad i think to start drawing some pictures um chris you were saying something about um IT, uh, IT lessens the chance of not knowing what to do in chaos. Do you want to just uh, elaborate <laughs> no, that, that was, for the tape? Well, that was meant to be it. Uh, IT, as far as I'm aware throughout my career, has heightened the chances of chaos. Um, <laughs> we've created tools that actually make it harder to get stuff done, but we feel good about it. So, you know, and we've provided an industry for people who need to fix it. So I guess it all works in the end. Um, yeah, but some of us wouldn't be on this call if that hadn't happened. <laughs> well, no, no. I, I think I, I was picking up on, on what Lou was saying about, you know, um, simulation opening brain power to, you know, better think about black swan events in reference to something else I was mentioning. And so, you know, you, you get the abductive reasoning nil hypothesis scenario where the only thing you can do is try to link patterns that are matching, like the logic of hunches, Dave calls it, mm. Um, mm. which is something that I do innately that not a lot of other people necessarily do but then I don't do things that other people do quite automatically I find that really difficult so you know this is where and I was going to mention earlier and I'll mention it a bit later not now but different like neurologies which is a part of, of humanity and neurodiversity we also need to be aware that OODA loops and everything won't be a generalistic term that we can apply across everything because everyone will be using it subjectively um, and so, yeah, the, the simulations are really valuable for getting you to think about knowing at least how to act in chaos or whatever. But I guess you've also got to be careful or hope that you aren't using the wrong simulations that are conditioning you to do the wrong thing if a different type of scenario comes up where it can be exploited. And I'm thinking of that in military or, or, or police terms, and I'm obviously going to defer to the military and the police people here for that because they'll know more about it than I will. So that's but if actually somebody a good... expects you to do something, then they can catch you out, essentially. So that's actually a good opportunity to ask the two police officers because they're serving uh, operational folks as, as opposed to the rest of us. Well, I never did, but some of us are doing much more quieter pursuits of uh, work now, like Ben and Ponch when he eventually gets his IT sorted out and gets back. Um, 
but when we talk about speeding up our OODA loops, we start, we talk about, I mean, because the topic was originally, how can how can Kinevin use be used to exploit what we know about OODA to get faster OODA loops? Well, so I'm listening to all this conversation. I'm thinking, well, a faster OODA loop means more implicit guidance and control, less thinking about it and decision making, more just happening and acting and it just naturally occurring. Is that what I'm hearing? I don't know. I'm looking at Ron and Lou on that one. And I think I think you're spot on in a lot of it. Yeah, uh, you know, we take these basic skills, and the sim and through the simulations, we were able to integrate them, and then also start to do some forward-looking kind of stuff where we're we're anticipating uh, patterns, anticipating behavior. Granted, you know, most of their stuff's in the uh, complex domain, and so you can get surprised, uh, and and things can go a different way than you might have expected, but. Uh, the more you practice at that and the more you work at dealing with those kind of surprises and and in using uh, all of the tools and skills available to you, uh, the better you are at running through that implicit guidance side and recognizing, okay, maybe this isn't going right, then that decision making side can kind of kick in and you can start to, it's, it's like running millions of little different experiments all along. I mean, for us from just showing up with the marked police car and the uniform, the how people react to those kind of things are really for us are experiments. We, we're, we're assessing their reaction right from the get go and and how they greet us and what goes on, you know. That's uh, um, and and running scenarios lets you start to get used to doing that, and uh, and then offloading some of that to the implicit side and and really focusing on the on the decision stuff you need to. Well, wow. so Ben, I'm going to invite you in and I want Kim to sort of talk about a few of the things after you that she's typing in the the, the channel and Ponch, I gave you co-host because I don't know if you're trying to hook up your iPad when you vanish from view earlier, but uh, if you need it, it's there. But start with Ben. Um, ben. Yeah, so I just want to address that, that question, like is a faster OODA loop about pushing more stuff into implicit guidance and control? And I think the maybe, answer is maybe. Uh, Unfortunately, both yes and no <laughs> at the same time, because on on the level in which we're doing the work or the, the task, let's let's call it a task, right? Let's let's call it a, an objective that we're trying to achieve. Pushing things into implicit guidance and control means that we do that better, right? But from the level of strategy, right? That's that's playing the game better. But from the level of strategy, strategy is about changing the game, right? So you take a step out of your tactical OODA loop. You know, the example of turning up in a marked, a marked police car versus not. Well, you might turn up in a marked police car versus not several times before you realize that you've got like a meta pattern there, right? So that to me is actually you're stepping out of implicit guidance and control because you're now thinking and you're now, you know, going through that cognitive loop, much, much more um, energy, um, you know, higher energy pathway to, to break these patterns down but your overall kind of you know bigger OODA loop is being improved by stepping out of implicit guidance and control I'm probably not explaining this at all well but you know it's it's definitely what what's what this is saying to me is it's definitely not as simple as push everything into implicit guidance and control get a better OODA loop win right because you have to also choose when your natural reaction in implicit guidance control is inappropriate and when you need to subvert that and step back out into the kind of bigger the bigger yeah okay and that, Wait, that away. but that's that's domain dependent right so if you're running through multiple yep. domains of the kinevin framework then implicit guidance and control is going to be required in a couple of domains and probably not in another one right or other two that, so that's the idea in some yeah yeah it could be so if we do have a good practice and that means we're in a clear domain uh, excuse me, a, a best practice in the clear domain, uh, it can be updated, right? It doesn't mean it's always the best thing. It is a best practice, um, but it can be updated. And in a good, in a complicated domain, we're running a good practice through implicit guidance control, potentially a good mental model. It can be updated, right? And one of the concepts we talk about is shared mental models of an expert team, an, an expert shared mental model of how to work together as a team. There are many of them. So there are many good mental models out there. So you can always update that that uh, as you go, right? 
But if you don't have one, you suck as a team, you suck as an individual, your, your, your OODA loop quality is low. So to me, it's not about going faster, it's about improving the quality of the loop. And that way you can actually control that tempo and you can control the speed, right? So uh, there's, there's a lot there. And I think um, uh, Lou had something on the mental models. Uh, he, he loves this stuff, I do too, Lou. I was talking about the appropriateness of implicit guidance and control is conditional on the accuracy of your mental models to real life, right? right? If you've got crappy or skewed mental modeling, then what you're shoving into the automatic might be inappropriate. So how do we use the simulations and the scenarios to artificially influence and, and develop our mental models to be as accurate as possible? Right, because uh, you know, in uh, in some circles in police training, it's worst case scenario over and over and over and over again. And what that does is it creates a conditioning that the old lady is actually a martial artist, that every kid is a black belt, right, and and, and every person with with hands in their pockets has a gun in there, and that is not an accurate representation, right? And it's causing automatic responses that are inappropriate. So what we've done is we've artificially uh, manipulated the mental modeling that does not replicate real life. That's, that's bad training, right? That's bad conditioning. Chris. Well, that, that ties very much into the idea of the first fit mental models that we tend to operate on, right? As opposed to the optimal fit. So when, you know, um, I know a lot of Dave's work on narrative and stuff and stuff that I was talking about, like in a, very briefly in the TEDx was about the, idea of you know you you actually we think we make informed decisions but actually we we use first fit mental models and we we then often base that decision off emotion where we think we've been extremely cognitive right and and that's and that's all it's been and of course bloom's taxonomy is all very well and good but we have harrow's taxonomy and craffold's taxonomy as well which is the effective and the psychomotor so all of these things like that there are multiple domains of of learning and, and models as well as multiple domains of ooda and multiple domains of thinking and so on. So yeah, that's that's really, I think the mental models are really important. Uh, yeah, go ahead. All right, so uh, I'm gearing up for an operation. It's probably one of the most stressful things that I'm gonna be doing this month. And uh, it's coaching my kids T-ball team without the other coaches, okay? Like of all the craziness that I've seen this week, coaching without those other dads is like scaring the crap out of me, right? Now, I wrote a LinkedIn post this week about it saying that it's truly chaotic because you got some modulators and attractors out there when a the ball gets hit, their swarm mentality. But if I use that T-ball team, right, and then watch how those boys are going to develop, right, until the time they're 18 years old playing the game of baseball, then I, I'm applying Kinevin to that. Like, how am I developing them, right? Because throwing the ball, batting the ball, right? Those are very clear things, right? They're replicable and it's done through practice. And I want to be as efficient as possible in teaching young boys, specifically my sons, right? How to do that, right? Uh, and yeah, there's going to be experimentation along the way, but it really is when you're more consistent doing things, you're going to execute the task better. And you no longer have to think about which foot to put forward when you're throwing the ball and which hand to put the glove on. That stuff becomes automatic, right? They have no freaking clue about the rules of the game at this point. It's all about the what, right? And it's, and, it, and more specifically, it's about the how, right? And then you start to develop like teamwork, right? Like fielding practice, like, yeah. oh, now it's not just I catch the ball, but I'm catching the ball at second base and I'm throwing it to the first baseman, right? So now you add a little bit into this and it's almost like you work your way around the, the Kinevin framework to this, right? So you've got like, individual skills, then you've got like team drills, then you've got scenario, if then thinking, two outs, runner on second, my team is down, with the balls pop fly over my head, what am I doing with it when I get the ball, right? So now when you start anticipating, right? No kid in, in, at, at six or seven years old has any type of anticipatory training, okay? It's, if I get the ball, I go to first base. That's it, right? They haven't anticipated all the other conditions, right? And the responses that go along with it. So when I think about faster OODA loops, I think about greasing OODA ahead of time by giving myself if-thens, 
Okay. I, I, I see Brian cocking his head. And so Ponch, what I'm talking about is grease it ahead of time with if and thens, right? And then I don't have to cycle through by using. Oh, I'm, I'm still here. No, go ahead. I'm trying to change slides here. I no longer have to develop hypotheses and, and, and work this angle here, right? I don't have to cycle through this. It becomes an orient, right? I've pre-oriented myself that if this happens, then boom, implicit guidance and control, do it fast, right? That's how I'm thinking about this right now is in, in, in youth sports is how do I develop somebody that knows nothing into task ex execution, into small team drills, into situational understanding, if then thinking, which is ultimately uh, still just a game that's pretty predictable, right? But I think we can even take that and get really good at, at developing our youth with that type of development model. So what I want to jump in is, because I wasn't going to do this because... Um, and Ponch, we have to, you and I have to behave on this because I'm going to go into this shared versus individual construct thing. Sorry, Ben, I'm going to bring this in and then because it goes to what Lou was talking about. He's talking about T-ball, which I guess is baseball for kids. Is that is that what T-ball is? I don't know. I'm a Brit living in America and I'm still trying to figure <laughs> these things out. So, you know, the Yankees, come on. <laughs> okay, all right, good enough. So the thing is this, that when you talk, so when we're talking about developing shared mental models and we develop it because that's sense making in the team, and we're talking about shared cognitions here, um, which again is happening at the team level, because we've got this implicit guidance and control and this model of UDA as an individual construct for the decision making that's going off in each individual's heads. And even a child is going to have their own OODA loop happening, their, their level of cognition their level of development is less than somebody who's 20 years older but uh, well potentially um so they've got this but once they move into a situation where other people are involved now uh whether the ball goes some chaos happens on the on the field or the pitch whatever it's called um english versus american language and uh and then things start to happen we're now interacting with other players who have their own individual OODA loops and we're now trying to have to make sense of what's going off some of our own implicit guidance and control is just telling us instinctively you know hey if the ball comes this way I know that my friend's going to run that way so that's just something it's implicit because it's something that's learned over a period of time um, but that starts to become quite important uh, it's because this, there's a, a conversation going on about whether or not there's such a thing as a OODA loop and punch is emphatically in the corner of the race and, and I'm on the fence trying to understand the literature and study this a bit more. But is the OODA loop, the, is, it, is there a team OODA loop or is it individual OODA loops? And then we start to get shared mental models, shared cognition, sense making between the individuals, which is something that gives us ability, but it's something different than the OODA loop as the drawing that we currently have, which was the last drawing made at the end of Boyd's life. I, I just want to throw that out there. And Ben, I don't know if you wanted to come in on that or anything else. Yeah, because it was sort of your segue into what Lou was saying. I can't, like, I, for, 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 yeah, for me, I can't, I can't. So a team playing another team has an oodle. I mean, it just, you know, if you get inside, and, and, and sometimes, um, let's take the New England Patriots. Sometimes the loop's pretty darn good, right? Um, and sometimes it's not. Uh, you can watch TV shows about the All Blacks and see how they play and see how their collective OODA loop is. And sometimes it's, it's not that great, right? So um, to me, it scales. And Ben just went over a couple of examples of it. Like we're running through multiple OODA loops in our head. I don't have one. I have several. And when I'm, when I'm doing options trading, the tactics I'm using are, are different than the, the sense making I'm doing at, the, at a strategic level than what I'm doing at operational level. So um, to me, I, I mean, when somebody says a team doesn't have an OODA loop, I'm like, what do they have? Is it an OODA loop or is it a shared mental model? It's, it's, a, it's an OODA loop. When, when you're flying fighter aircraft and you're in a division and you're fighting, uh, flying to strike, you have an OODA loop, right? And you're only as good as the, the collective, right? So if your enemy has a better OODA loop, you're going to you're, you're get smoked. Now, some people in your flight may have more awareness than others. Um, 
And that's why we have distributed leadership in, in aviation is so we can have that transfer of leadership to somebody who has more situational awareness at that moment. It's not a, it's not a hierarchy, right? But so when you, trans when you transfer that leadership, you're now in their OODA loop, not in your OODA loop. No, no, because we're all contributing yeah. to it, right? We're all contributing, our sensors, our minds, are we in position? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Am I three quarters of a mile or a mile and a half where I need to be a beam? Uh, are, am I pointed hot or cold when I need to be? Uh, you know, where, are they 60 miles behind me, 50 miles behind me? Is everybody where they need to be? And that's that, that OODA loop we're working on to go in and, and be really effective. Now, if there's something broken in that, um, we might get lucky, right? We might get lucky that day. The enemy may not be as good, uh, but there are times we may have the best OODA loop and just get really unlucky and, and, and bad things happen to us. But the collective OODA loop is there, right? Uh, from, from the strategic level all the way down to the tactical level. Many, many, many OODA loops going on up and down. And unfortunately, what we saw with the, uh, the introduction of uh, predators and, and you know early um, uh, ISR platforms is that transfer of situational awareness went to the strategic level or the operational level. So you have the thousand, we used to call it the uh, thousand mile screwdriver, right? Somebody sitting back, drinking a coffee, uh, watching the screen going, don't they know that's happening to them? Well, we probably do, but um, we also, we're also in the fight. We're the closest ones to the fight right there. So, um, I, I mean, to me, it's, you know, anybody that's arguing that there's not a team Muda loop, I'm like, what the hell is it? Well, that's then, the thing. Have is you it, read Boyd? <laughs> is yeah. it? Well, so, all right. I'm, 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 let's, Ben, you had your hand up a minute ago. Then I'm going to Chris, yeah. and I want to hear from the, the cops because... They're living this actually in real life every day now. We're just trying to t teach corporations how not to be so daft. But Ben. So I just came off um, just before this. I, I came off a live session teaching Mission Command uh, as part of my course. Um, and so one of one of my uh, well, I, I don't really want to call people students because we're all learning from each other ultimately, but one of the guys who's taking my course is also an ex-Royal Marine who is now a head of product at a very fast growing startup. And he understands mission command. Like we, we've had a great conversation um, equating mission command with things like base camps shape up methodology. And, you know, we could have a whole other conversation about how, how they screwed their own OODA loop quite recently. Um, but he, he came up with this great example of, exactly what we're just talking about so i'm gonna i'm going to basically rip it off and, and repeat it here and he came up with the example of a peloton in the tour de france right different teams with different styles of leadership right one team who the coach is right is, is driving along beside them in the car screaming instructions right pure command and control telling every every individual what to do and the peloton is an inherently chaotic situation right you you don't know what's going to happen. So when the shit hit the fan and the guy was no longer there shouting instructions, they fell apart. Whereas another team had um, commander's intent. They had a very short briefing at the beginning of the day, like, okay, this is, this is the intention for today. Our intention is to get this guy to the front at the opportune time. That gave all of the people within that team the ability to operate within their um, within their experience to manage the chaos and to choose the opportune time to move together. And now that I don't, and, and you know, they would have had their own kind of communications and compression of how they, how they communicated, but they also had a rain plan, like actions on rain. What are we going to do when it starts raining and everything becomes more dangerous and it's more difficult. And just the simple process of, you know, a, a pre-flight briefing essentially gives you the direction, it gives you that orientation, that team orientation, which is an intangible, very difficult to quantify, probably impossible to measure, locus of, of orientation for a team, which is the team OODA loop, right? Everyone has their own individual OODA loops, but a team, I think I'm, I'm definitely on Ponch's end of the fence here, is a team definitely has something intangible that is something greater than the sum of the parts. And I agree with that. I just don't know whether it's called an oodle loop, but let's park my nonsense for a minute. Chill, punch. Chris. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm not 
disagreeing with what Ben and Ponch have said at all. Um, you know, I think that there is absolutely that. But as I'm listening to it, I'm just thinking about things like um, tuning and vibrations. Like, is it possible? that actually everyone does have their own nuda loop but for the for the purposes of what's happening at that point in time they're actually in tune so somebody can fall out of it without disturbing what everyone else is so it may and i'm not saying that there isn't a team nuda loop but if if everyone has the same nuda loop that they're following at the same time does that is that not something that that could potentially be and a, an example you could use is you know would you give a whole team uh, that may be spread out or, or may not be spread out one compass or would everyone have their own compass and although all of their compasses would be infinitesimally slightly different for true north they'd still all be moving in the same direction it, it's just something that that i thought was worth kind of bringing up no i think that's good and and actually what you're describing is being in the zone or as mill i called it flow so that what you just described was flow but from a psychological point of view when you're in the zone um Ron, I'm going to invite you if you've got some comments and then we'll we'll head back to Lou, obviously, at some point. And, and Kim and Andrew, if you want to jump in, feel free. But Ron, I'm interested because there's some great conversation going up in the chat channel, which, of course, only we see. Um, but, you know, about being in, you know, detective partners in the interrogation room, the chemistry between them. Uh, Ponch and Chris are both using the word resonance as a as a, an adjective, I guess, or a, something like that. Uh, and then and Lou was talking about being in operational briefings earlier on as well. So, Ron, what's your thoughts? So, I, and I think that flow is 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 really uh, kind of what you're talking about here. That integrated uh, team uh, OODA loop. Uh, I'm right there with uh, with Ponch on that. Um, you know, especially when you're talking about people on teams, you're talking about complex adaptive systems and flow is a huge piece of what complex adaptive systems are all about. So uh, you've got to uh, incorporate pattern recognition, blocking, um, you know, all of that is, and, and, and I think that's a lot what you're trying to do going back to the simulation stuff. When you're doing simulation with other people, you're trying to build that capacity for that flow, for that shared OODA loop, for that, for that, uh, for the pattern recognition, and for uh, the leadership transitions, where one person may see something that somebody else doesn't, and it's okay. You're in a safe space where rank doesn't matter. Uh, it, you know, I would show up on calls as a lieutenant, and I tell the tell my guys, I'd, I'd, I'd train them up. Look, when I show up, I'm just like one of you guys until I take command and I start telling you what to do. I'm just like you, if you're the primary, if you're the uh, contact officer and you're dealing with a situation, I'm there to back you up. I'm there to follow the lead, to find some work, to make good things happen. Um, and, and that works really, really well when the team embraces it and, and, and works in it. And, and you, could, you can really just crush it. Uh, look at all-star teams, great individual OODA loops and you throw those all-star teams together and they fall apart because they don't have that shared uh, mental model. They don't have that shared understanding of who's going to be where, what's going to happen on the, on the court or on the field or the pitch. Um, and, and uh, they can't anticipate things start to fall apart. Then they start getting frustrated. Each individual tries to carry it and, and it just goes sideways. You, you've got to have both the individual loops and that group loop to make it happen. I agree with everything everybody's saying. I think it's an, a nomenclature thing, but I'm not going to. And, 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 and Ponch was so excited. I, I, it's a while since I've seen him so excited. But Lou, what? Uh, and we're getting close to our time. But what other thoughts have you got from the conversation so far about? Because there's some great things going off about, you know, examples like shoals of fish moving together in harmony. They move together. At the, they have their own individual sort of decision-making process, OODA loop, but they move together in great harmony. You see that with flocks of birds, and I forget what you call a, a thing of birds when they're doing all those things, uh, but looks really pretty and beautiful in the sky. Um, and, a, a what? Murmuration. Thank you very much. A murmur, a, a murmuration. There you go. Um, but, and I agree that when you take the sum of all the people, the sum of it is greater than the sum of the parts, which is where people get into this fantastic sort of, sh the, all the words you've been using, resonance. And there was another, another great word that was used in the uh, resonating, resonating harmony. You act as one when you're in the zone, you're in the flow. I agree with all those things. 
I, I really do. Um, but and that's what we're trying to build when we talk about team effectiveness in the work I've been doing, because we want effective teams, just not performance teams, because performance and effectiveness, different things, of course. Um, and, and Chris is, wants to, to I will come back to you in a second, Chris. I've just seen you know in the chat as well. Make sure because the chat's going crazy now. I've really excited you all. Um, uh, Lou, any comments on what uh, Ron and everybody else has just been saying? I de desperately want to get some comments from from Andrew and from Kim, who've been rather silent while all these flyboys have been giving it large. All right, so, <laughs> so through this, I've refined my thoughts uh, since about an hour ago about what it takes to get faster OODA loops. And it's about creating better mental models and a lattice work of thinking models. And I, I separate them because I separate a mental, and some people may say a thinking model is a type of mental modeling or, or vice versa, whatever, but I'm just gonna keep them separate. That a mental model is a representation of how reality works, how things are, right? Versus a thinking model could be processes or the things that we put our brain through to make a decision, right? And if I put those two things inside Orient, right? Well, when I, when I teach and explain UDA, the only thing out of Boyd's, uh, you know, the, the, the five categories in there that I really keep are, I keep previous experiences. Um, and, and I add in mental models from them and thinking models. And I want to share one example of a thinking model. And, you know, this, uh, this Illinois model here was something that, uh, this is like Illinois model uh, 2.0, which is basically a police decision-making framework. And you start at the top, you work your way down, and this helps in the synthesis phase, right? This helps synthesize options for us to push through and to evaluate the, the, their appropriateness. And I think we need teams that have good thinking models for when the situations are novel, right? Because if it's not novel, you're not really thinking, Right, you're, you're just kind of responding to how you've been conditioned. So let's let's populate our minds with a lattice work and, and, and layers upon layers and diverse different thinking models so we can work through these problems into how to analyze and how to synthesize new options. That's, that, that's my new take on this. And I think that we can do this using Kinevin to, to speed it up by helping uh, refine our execution, right, in our performance of task work, um, to be able to use if-then thinking when appropriate and to uh, this anticipatory versus uh, predictive thinking, and then all the types of scenarios and simulations. Because again, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize it with this. The way for faster, better OODA loops is more robust, accurate mental models and a lattice work of thinking models for the novel. Wow. That's pretty cool stuff. Chris, you want you, you were putting a bunch of things in there about hyper process. Um, but just there were some comments in there. And I want to go then Andrew and to Kim because they were writing some good stuff. So Chris, please finish that. I just thoughts. want to say a lattice work of thinking models for the now is a fantastic uh, phrase. So yeah, that, that's really, really good. I I, I wanted to, to just mention this because it was something I was told yesterday. Um, so I was talking to an assessor for autism and she was talking about how people with autism, Dave talks about autism in terms of computation. And so it's a parallel processing. And there are, there are there's, there's this thing called the intense world theory of autism where you create way too many um, hyper neuroplastic uh, connections when you're young and your brain doesn't clear them up. So you have parallel processing. Um, th this is, it's only one theory, it may not necessarily be correct but it means that you sense the world differently, you experience the world much more intensely and you think differently and you think very often faster. So what I was told was um, you have no idea of when to intuit a conversation and what it means, what the rules mean while you're doing it. So I very often speak over people or I don't know what I'm saying, Andrew can attest to all of this. I, I randomly say crap or whatever and people go, this Chris guy is a bit weird even for a dude with a beard and long hair, but um, basically, I kind of get all of this, right? But what she said to me was, a lot of the time people don't know that because you process everything hyper fast in real time and you're actually doing what other people are doing subconsciously and naturally in terms of understanding the social dynamics. 
you understand the why and the empathy of people. So you understand the path dependency better. I'm paraphrasing here. She didn't say it quite like this, but you understand the path dependency better than even perhaps they may sometimes. So you know why they've done what they've done or why they're doing what they're doing, but you don't know what the rules are for what's happening right now. And you don't know how to interact with it. So what you're doing, I don't know if you saw the, the thing recently with Elon Musk on Saturday Night Live, uh, but he said, I'm very good at running human in emulation mode. And that literally is what is being done in a hyper fast process. So it's a hyper fast, I guess, OODA loop where I'm constantly analyzing what people are doing and saying and saying, I hope they don't know I'm actually one of the lizard men. But there are things that I can't do that other people just take for granted without even thinking. So what she said to me was, you get very tired because you are constantly under cognitive load because you are processing it, not just mm. reacting. So I, I really wanted to drop that in there because I think it's relevant to a lot of the stuff we've talked about. So if you want innovators, mavericks, heretics, um, outliers, very often they will be engineers or scientists or whatever who have autistic traits because they think differently. So mixing them into teams that have OODA loops that are normal if you want to look at them in that way although there's no such thing really as normal that's where you may get innovation or disruption that can help you with null hypothesis scenarios or um orthodoxy shifts and you know trophic cascades and all that kind of apex predator stuff so anyway i'm gonna shut up there and, and leave that open but i thought that was interesting so actually that segues nicely to something that andrew was saying in the chat earlier on he's saying tenure is what makes this hard really really hard organizationally people come from all over the place with different training programs if any and then might spend two to three years on average within an organization there's such a churn rate but actually that sort of segues to what you were saying because that's about cognitive diversity in the groups as well andrew is there anything you want to add to the to what you've heard and uh, we'll keep going for a few minutes because I desperately want to bring Kim in as well. And, and Ben's getting all excited again. And I know Ponch can't leave without saying more. So, Andrew. Yeah, look, I mean, this has been a fascinating conversation. Um, I'm struggling to keep up because it is quite early. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly trying to bring this back to the business world. Um, and one of the big challenges we have is we don't have academies. We don't have... Uh, long onboarding programs like you do in the military, like you're doing in the police force. So you tend to get people who, who land in a team and you don't know what their developmental pathway to get there is. Um, now for some of the older professions, um, so things like accounting and things like uh, legal and, and, and some of the things that have been around for a lot longer um, they have very well established um, developmental pathways, which means that you have a loose idea of what you're getting from someone when, when they land. And they've also got professional bodies that um, enforce that constant learning and, um, and, and, and bring new practice in and, and do that as a professional body. But lots of parts of organisations, you're in very immature fields and to a certain extent the professional bodies uh in it, it appears that the professional bodies in their early stages are more interested in staking out territory than getting really good at doing things so you, you've got the professional bodies that rise but they try to take more of the pie rather than looking at the role that the profession plays in the creation of value. Um, and, and it's a, I, I think there's just a bit of, you get patch wars and stuff like that that probably don't exist so much when you've got hundreds and hundreds of year old professions. Um, so that's a real challenge, I suppose, is how do you, uh, with, with organizations investing what usually 1.5% maximum of uh, salary into learning and development um like how how do you kind of get really good at this stuff in such a um, adaptive space with such low tenure so ben says he's got something that connects to what you were just saying so we will get to kim eventually bless her go on ben sorry kim um yeah so so a couple of extra comments um on, on what uh, and builds on what Andrew was saying and this came up in this mission command talk that I was uh, telling you about just a minute ago so so 
current businesses are changing faster than ever before. I think it's fair to say, certainly tech businesses, right? The tech landscape is an exponentially shifting fitness landscape from, from one point of view. Um, also, people are cycling in and out of those companies faster than possible. You know, tenure is getting lower and lower. No such thing as jobs for life anymore. So that makes me want to ask, what actually is a company these days, right? Because if the people are constantly cycling through and the culture is held in the people, what is the company, right? So to take Lou's, to integrate Lou's point about mental models and, and a lattice, right? There needs to be some repository of mental models and practice and systems such that people can slot into their places in the, in the lattice, do the thing that they've been employed to do and improve the structure of the lattice as they do so. And then they move on because they found something else. They found something else that interests them. So I think, you know, the, the role of a company in value creation is, I think, changing quite profoundly with the, the, the impact of technology. And it's really now about capturing that value and that direction that people want to be going in as they move through the contact with that company, which might be short-term contract. It might be, you know, they might be somebody who stays for 18 months. They might be a new marketing director who comes on just to spin up a, a, a practice within a new business. So I think, you know, the, whatever we're talking about with mental models and orientation and, and the, the structure, that, that is what companies need to be able to kind of separate from the people that move through those roles. And that's, that's the company, usually, right? That's your role as somebody who owns a company or is the, the leader of a company is curating and being the custodian of that system such that you capture the value of people as they, not only as they work in that system, but as they move through it. So I don't know, this is not very Uderish, I know. I, I went off, off on a bit, off on one <laughs> a bit. Well, well, Kim, can you make any sense of the last few conversations? Sure. So I think a lot of the examples that we spoke about from my perspective sit outside of the complex domain. So if you think about the teaming examples and getting to harmony and resonance in the teams and we're all very well practiced and we can adapt to a lot of different types of situations, I think there's something in um, a much deeper, broader conversation teasing out between when those harmonic teams are actually responding to a chaotic event and when they're actually exploring complexity. So I think there's a little bit of an overlap in there and I'd, I'd like to understand and explore the difference, how you would describe the difference between that harmonic team responding to chaos and that harmonic team exploring complexity. And we started with the, we need to speed up our OODA loops. So I think it's perfectly valid to speed up predictable OODA loops in those three domains. So clear, complex, uh, clear, chaotic and complicated but you have to speed up a very different type of OODA loop in complex. And I think it's very easy to be wandering along going fast, 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 because I think it's predictable and suddenly, and I think that is the cliff into chaos <laughs> is initially, oh shivers, I've gone into a complex domain and this is no longer a valid way to do the work. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot in that, but that's how I kind of see it. and yes, where people come from and what kind of training and background they've had makes a huge difference and can create chasms. Um, yeah, so I think that that's where I was sort of bringing it all and together. That's actually an important point because that's the one thing in, in, in Boyd's model or in the OODA loop diagram when he talks about cultural background, which is for some people a sensitive topic, but that really is something that's very important because depending upon our, nat our, nurt our nature, as well as our nurture has a significant impact on our ability to function in different things, which actually, and I'm going to get some final comments of people because it actually sort of hints a little bit to what uh, Lou was saying about a potential uh, elaboration of the discussion in the next session, the dark side of diversity, why shared accurate mental modeling is necessary and how diversity helps and hinders the refinement of team and individual models. So that's that. And that's a little bit of what you were digging into, Kim. And I think that 
if you were kind enough after we've finished the call today to send me uh, a few bullets on suggesting the uh, deeper exploratory, which you were just describing about complexity and the OODA loops and things. And I'll combine that with what Lou was talking about, because I think that will make a fascinating exploratory. Um, Ponch, you were writing some really good stuff in the chat as well. For organizations to survive, they need to co-evolve with their environment while maintaining internal stability. Thus, it requires variety, creativity, and learning communities. An organization must embody enough diversity to stimulate learning, but not enough to over overwhelm the legitimate system and cause anarchy. Uh, do you want to add anything there? Final comments, Punch? No, that's just from uh, Franz Ozinga. So he, he's done a lot of great work with uh, science strategy and warfare, and then some of his newer work is Air Power Reborn. Um, he, he's he lived here in my neighborhood, by the way, many years ago, just a stupid fact. But um, the, the key about this is, you know, an organiz organization is an organism. That's that's what he viewed um, when, when he started learning about complex adaptive systems. So, it, you know, nonlinear systems generally have this inherently the same structure. That's that's some basic thinking. Um, so when you look at a team, an individual uh, fish, uh, or large organizations, they have inherently the same structure. So my, my point is why would the OODA loop be different for everyone, right? So this gets away from fractal natures of things. It's, it kind of violates that stuff. So uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer that it, we treat things, um, you know, for things to scale, they need to have some type of similarity. They have to work in other domains by different people. We, we've gone over that many, many times. But uh, I, I highly recommend, uh, if you haven't read Ozinga's books, go buy them. Uh, Air Power Reborn is going to be hard to find. Uh, you're going to spend a lot of money on it, but it's absolutely worth the read. So just uh, before we get last comment, I want to ask Ron for the final comments. But just before, Ben just wrote something I think is fascinating to share with people who watch the video, which is up until the 15th century, organism and organization were actually the same word. Don't you just love the English language, you know? So uh, although anything that ends in T-I-O-N originates from the French language, but I'm not sure about an ism and a shun coming out of the English. Anyway, I'm going to stop rambling. Um, Ron, make sense of the madness and then we'll uh, we'll adjourn for yet another session. This this These conversations are mind-blowingly fascinating. Ron. Absolutely. Mind-blowingly fascinating. Um, and, and I'm challenged to make sense of all of it, but I think uh, we're on the right track with looking at, uh, at uh, uh, the complex adaptive systems, the organizations, the individuals, and how they work together. I love Kim's idea about teasing out that stuff uh, in, the, uh, in the transitions between complex chaos and and those uh, those situations because they're really uh, I, I think those are really important. Um, you know, training the transitions, uh, simulating the transitions is is every bit in, as important as those individual skills or individual ideas to get you through the loop. Um, and I think that's really really worth uh, worth exploring. Just super stuff here. What a, what a blast to be involved. <laughs> I absolutely agree with you and. I'm really grateful to our Australian colleagues for hauling out of bed in the crack of dawn and getting up at 5, yeah. 5.30 to join us at 6 a.m. The Brits are okay. They're at the end of the day and they've got the alcohol hidden discreetly. And the rest of us are in the middle of the afternoon in, the, in, in America. So that's good as well. So I'm going to stop the recording so we can sign off. But again, another fascinating discussion. <laughs>